if you're not fortunate enough to own one of these, but you do own one of these, or one of these, or you actually have one of these, then you can kind of relive the experience of a native Atari ST by building a Raspberry Pi that boots straight into an emulator like Atari and goes straight into the TOS operating system. So I built one such that you can see here, and I call it my Atari Pi. I was going to call it my Pi ST, but then I realized that that kind of spelled out a rude word if you weren't careful and perhaps best not a. So step one in our journey is to choose a Pi operating system and write that to an SD card. The easiest way to do that is to use the Raspberry Pi imager application. Now that's located at raspberrypi.com, so let's head over there and download it. Once it's downloaded, I open the installer image and drag Raspberry Pi images into the applications folder, and that installs it. On Windows, that'll be an MSI that you execute, and on Debian-based Linux distros, you would install it using sudo apt install rpi-imager. Other distros have more yummy mechanisms, and snap packages are probably available for most OSs too. Let's run the imager and get to choosing our operating system. I chose Raspberry Pi OS Lite. 64 bit. This is a minimal operating system with no desktop or GUI. It just boots straight into the console. So after selecting the OS, I chose my target SD card to write to. This is a 64 gig card, which is far too big for our use, but it's just what I had at hand. The minimum SD card size for this version of the operating system is four gigabytes. And while that might be sufficient, I think. 8 gig is probably the start of the sweet spot, but I've only tested this build on a 64 gig and a 32 gig card. So having transferred our SD card to our Pi, let's boot and perform the initial setup. Now, I've got to warn you here, my capture card doesn't deal with the 4K output of the Raspberry Pi very well. It tends to flicker a little bit. So I'll do my best to try to remove that, but I, I do apologize. So the first thing that happens on the Pi boots is it'll straight away reboot again. And what it's doing there is it's resizing the SD card image so that the hard drive takes up the entire space. So once back in Rao Pi, we set the keyboard layout to your country of choice. And then we create a username. I'm creating the user David B. If you do this at home and choose a different user, there are a couple of places in the process that we're going through where we're going to need to use paths into, say, the home directory that will contain that username. So I will try to point out everywhere where you'll need to make changes. Next, we set the password. And this will be needed for remote access to the Pi. So post a reboot, I log in and run raspy config. Well, I mean, after a typo, I do. So the first stop is to go to systems options and then boot stroke auto logon. And I'm going to select console auto login as the David B user. Now, this will allow us to bypass login when running the Raspberry Pi locally. Next, we go into interface options and down to SSH and we enable SSH. This is going to allow us to remotely log in and transfer files from another computer onto this Pi. Finally, system options, then wireless LAN and set our wireless country code, the SID and our nice long passphrase. Now we exit the Raspberry Pi and do a reboot. So post reboot, I'm using ifconfig to get our IP address so that I can log in remotely. And in this case, under WLAN, we can see inet 192.168.50.254. That's the IP address for my machine on my network. So for most of the rest of this process, we'll be performing our tasks remotely using SSH. Right, so let's log on to our Pi via SSH from, in my case, my Mac. The command is SSH space username at machine name. In our case, we're using David B as the user. We get a message saying that certificate fingerprint is unknown. And do we trust this machine? We say yes, and please store the key for future use. We enter our password and we're in. So the terminal I use on Mac OS is Kitty. And by default, if I try to delete text like LS in this case, I get two spaces rendered. That's because of terminal mapping. So I need to tell the remote session to use Xterm as the terminal type. So I'm going to type term equals Xterm. You probably won't need to do this. So just ignore it when you see it. But just so you know, you might have to do it. 
So when we booted our Pi before, you saw two things. One was a highly colored splash screen that looks like a cross section through an RGB cube to me. And then you saw a vomit of logging showing boot progress. We want neither of those. Let's get rid of the splash screen first. Before I actually can do that, I'm going to need a text editor. Now there is a built-in one called Nano and many people like that, but I prefer to use Vim. So I'm going to install that using sudo apt install Vim. Okay, back to removing the splash screen image. Let's edit the file slash boot slash config dot text. And notice I prefixed the command with sudo because it's a protected file and you need to be root to edit it. Let's go to the very end and we're going to insert the line disable underscore splash equals one. So next let's address that vomit of logging that gets sprayed down the screen at boot time. And to do this, we edit the file slash boot slash command line dot text, cmd line dot text that is. To achieve what we want, we set the console from TTY1 to TTY3, and we append the following to the end of the line, which are, is quiet splash and logo dot no logo. Okay, let's reboot our Pi and through the magic of picture in picture, see what we get. Basically a lot of black, a flashing cursor, and we're logged in as, in our case, David B. So the next step is to get our custom splash screen to be displayed at boot time. So to do that, we're going to install the application FBI, which is a frame buffer image viewer. We do that with sudo apt install FBI. So to configure our machine, we're going to need a folder structure to store our Hatari executables, our ROMs, hard drive images, and of course, our splash screen. So let's do that while we're here. And I'm creating the folders bin, st, and git. So bin is where Hatari will live, st is where our emulator files will be, and git is where we're going to build Hatari. So under st, I'm going to create all the folders that I normally have in my Hatari configs. So toss, where I put my ROM files, hdd, where I put my hard drive image, gemdos, and a subfolder called D for my gemdos D drive and splash where we're going to put our splash screen. So to get our files, in this case, our splash screen image from our host machine onto our Pi, we're going to need to install an FTP application. Now, while there are many commercial applications for this, FileZilla is a free, very capable FTP program. So let's install that. I've put all the files I want to transfer into a folder on my desktop named Raspi. Now I cover the folder structure on the host machine in detail in the video where I show people how to use my Atari hard drive image. So I'll put a link to that in the description below. So for now, I'm just going to copy and paste stuff across. So in FileZilla, we enter the URL of our Pi as sftp colon slash slash and then the address of the Pi. And in this case, we put the IP address that we collected earlier. We enter the username, David B, and the password for our user. Obviously, in your case, you may have a different username and certainly should have a different password, I hope. So we confirm that we will use the unknown key. That's fine. I don't choose to store it. So next time I'll get the same message. In the UI, we see our file system on the left and the Pi is on the right. So I'm going to find my desktop folder on the left, and then I'm going to copy over the hard drive image into the HDD folder. And I am going to speed this up because it's quite big and it takes quite a long time. Next, we copy the splash screen image over and our toss ROM image. Finally, a service definition file is copied across that will configure the system to run our splash screen at boot. And let's have a look at that service definition file we copied over. So most of this is just boilerplate. The exec start line is the code that will actually get run at boot time. And as you notice, it runs the FBI command and displays the image of our splash screen from its folder. So this is one of these cases where you will need to edit the user if you're following along at home and you're using a different username. So to install this service and make it run on all future boots, we need to copy it to slash etc slash systemd slash system. And that copy has to be run as super user because this is a system folder. And then we enable it by typing sudo system cottle enable splash screen. Now that we've done that, let's reboot. And then we should see no pi splash, no console output, and it should finish with our splash screen displayed on the command line. And we should be logged in as we are. Marvelous.
So the next step is building Hatari. You might ask why build it? So initially I did try to do an app install of Hatari when I first set up one of these machines. And when I ran it, I got an error message. It couldn't open some device. So I was chasing down and adding packages to fix it and realized I was pretty much installing X Windows at this point. So I stopped and decided to try building it myself and see if it worked. And it did. And to be honest, it's not difficult. So let me show you how. Quick look at the build guide on the Hatari website shows that there are some mandatory and optional dependencies. Looking at the optional dependencies, we're going to want Zlib because we're going to want to be able to use uh, ST image files that are inside of a, a zip file. And we're going to want libping so we can do screenshots. So let's install our dependencies, starting with the optional ones. So lib readline dev, lib 1g dev, and lib png dev. Notice in the lib Zlib case, it's 1g, not lg. Next up are the mandatory dependencies. That's CMake and lib sdl2 dev. Now these are the biggies, especially the AA lib sdl. That takes quite a while to install, so I'm going to fast forward it. Next, it's time to get the source code. So let's cd in our git folder and do the following command, which is git clone git colon slash slash git dot tuxfamily dot org git root forward slash Atari forward slash Atari dot git. That'll download the sources into a folder named Atari. If you get an error at this point saying you can't find the command git, you will need to do a sudo apt install git. Next, we cd into the Hatari folder. We create a subfolder named build and we cd into that. Now we enter the command time space cmake space dot dot. The time prefix tells Linux the time how long the operation takes. That's 11 seconds in our case. And the dot dot after cmake tells cmake to look into the folder below for its configuration. So at the end there, notice the summary section confirms our desired dependencies were found. So it's got the zlib and it's got libping. So next we type make to build Hatari. And we're going to time that again because that takes a long time to run. That takes 19 minutes. So that's going to be sped up and truncated, you can bet. But um, if you're following along at home, time to go and make a cup of tea. So once the build completes, let's copy the Hatari executable into the bin folder for our user. So notice the tilde slash bin means our user's home directory bin folder. So next we're going to configure Hatari. And I'm going to do that in my usual way. And I've covered this many times. So this is somewhat tricky to do in our case because the mouse only works in the emulator. So in the settings dialog, we're going to have to move around the UI using the left and right arrow keys, pressing enter to select and space to toggle checkboxes and radio buttons. So I'm sorry if this appears a little confusion. So I'm running Hatari on the Pi. You get an error about ROMs being missing. You can ignore that safely. So now we're going to go around the UI. So let's go into the system section and check everything is stock. It is. So next let's go to CPU and we'll verify a stock 68,000 running at eight megahertz, which is what we want. Then we go to TOS and we select our image from our home ST ROMs folder. Next, we go to memory and we navigate to the four megabyte radio button and we press space, make sure it's selected, and then we click back in the main menu. Now, for hard drives, we go into the hard drive configuration, browse to the ASCI image. We go to home, ST, HDD, and select the 5112.image file. We go back and stay on the hard drive page, and then we navigate to the GEMDOS section and hit the Browse button. And we pick our home ST GEMDOS folder as the root of GEMDOS drives. So that will give us a drive D, which will be mounted on the, the Raspberry Pi file system so using FileZilla, you can copy files from your host, drop them into that D drive, and they will appear inside your Atari ST. We also select add gem drives after ACSI and other drives. And then we also check boot from hard drive. Then we return to the main menu. So next we go into Atari monitor settings and set mono mode because we're productivity people. Finally, we navigate to the Atari screen settings and set indicators to none to get rid of the states bar at the bottom of the screen. I don't want to see that. Breaks my immersion. So back on the main menu, we select save config, press OK. And we're going to save them. Just take the defaults. We'll save it in the default position. Back in the main menu for the last time, we navigate to quit and press OK. So we're back on the command line and let's run Hatari again. And everything looks good.
So the last part of our build is to make Atari start at boot time. So to do this, we're going to edit the startup script slash etc slash rc.local. And in the main body of that script, we add the line su space minus space david b space minus c space slash home slash david b slash bin slash atari and then space ampersand. So what's that line doing? It's saying execute as david b, run the command slash home slash david b slash bin slash atari. In other words, start atari. Note this is another one of those places where you will want to change my username to your username. And the ampersand at the end of the line says detach this from the console and run it in the background. Let's reboot and let's see what it looks like end to end. And that's exactly what we wanted. And by the way, if that captured footage looks better than the rest, that's because my new 4K capture card arrived exactly at the end of making this video. That's the way it goes. So that's it. It's the mission accomplished. I hope you enjoyed this guide to creating an Atari Pi. Let me know in the comments if you played along and how it worked out. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you soon.